All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Today is December the 4th, 2021, a little bit after 3 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we thank you for joining us for the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, today on our meeting, we have Mr. Dave Dion that's going to be on with us. Uh, he's going to be talking about carving on the curve. Uh, but before we get started with Dave, I just want to go through a few things that's going on with the International Association of Woodcarvers. Um, coming up in the coming weeks, we have a few meetings scheduled till the end of the year. Uh, next week, Mr. Dell Green, CCA member, is going to be on with us. Uh, that's on December the 11th, and he's going to be doing a demonstration, talking to us about uh, caricature carving. Uh, I think I saw Dell on the meeting there just a few minutes ago. And then on December the 18th, Eric Owens is going to be on with us, and we're going to be doing some giveaways and stuff on the 18th uh, to get ready for Christmas. Uh, we'll be off on Christmas uh, weekend and New Year's weekend, and then we hope to be starting back up at the beginning of January with meetings on Saturdays. Uh, we'll be talking about the upcoming schedule as that becomes available and uh, posting that out on social media. Uh, so make sure you check social media to find out who's going to be our pre presenters coming up in January. I know so far we've got Dave Francis, uh, Bob Hershey, and Kevin Applegate scheduled uh, coming up at the beginning of the year, uh, and that's in 2022. So look forward to those meetings. I uh, want to remind everybody to go out and check out Wood Carving Academy. Uh, there's some workshops that's going on right now. I know Kevin Applegate had one today. He's going to have another one tomorrow. Uh, there's a realistic wolf uh, carving class with Janet Cordell uh, that's starting on Monday, December the 6th. Uh, some of the classes you can still get into that's uh, scheduled on January the 8th, Ryan Olson is going to be doing a design and carving miniatures class. Uh, so make sure you reach out to Ryan if you're interested in signing up for that class. I've taken one of his miniature classes before. Uh, and it's a great class, so make sure you reach out to Ryan if you want to get in that class. And then uh, Dave Stetson's got another class uh, that he's going to be starting on January the 8th on carving facial planes. It's a facial plane study. Uh, Dave's on our meeting today. If you're interested in joining that class, uh, should be another great class uh, with Dave. Reach out to him, sign up, uh, and he'll give you all the details there. Uh, those are the classes that we have scheduled so far uh, for workshops through the Wood Carving Academy. If you're looking for a special gift, uh, for that wood carver in your life or for yourself for Christmas, uh, Wood Carving Academy has subscriptions out there that you can also sign up for. Uh, the fee is low. The videos are great. I've gone out and sampled a lot of the videos. Uh, it's really beneficial if you want to learn at your own pace. And if you want to go back and rewatch videos, uh, make sure you check out Wood Carving Academy. We're going to be giving away a certificate for a month subscription to them. Uh, on that last meeting on the 18th. So make sure you join us on the 18th to, uh, to take a chance on, on winning that. So um, having, all, having said all of that, uh, today we've got Dave Dion on. Um, Dave's coming to us from Pennsylvania. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the CCA competition, Dave did really well in the CCA competition this year. Uh, he got first, second, and third place on the carvings that he submitted. Um, so if you get a chance, go out to the CCA page, check out the carvings that, uh, that he submitted there and all the winners on their page. But I think Dave's going to be talking about that today. Uh, Dave is going to be talking about carving on the curve. Uh, and he's going to be talking about carving a character out of a book, um, that Dave, um, Malin, I think is the way you pronounce it. Um, here's the book here. Uh, it's a book called Book of Drawings, and today in our meeting, we're actually going to uh, auction this book off. This book is autographed by the, uh, the writer of the book. Uh, Dave's going to talk a little bit more about that, but if you're interested in winning this book, uh, we're going to open the bids down in the chat, so make sure that you go ahead and bid on that. Again, it's an autographed copy. Um, I'll show you here. There's the autograph. And uh, we'll send it out to the winner. All the proceeds for this book will go towards the International Association of Woodcarvers fees for the Zoom meetings uh, so that we can continue these meetings going forward. So again, if you're interested in winning the book, and again, Dave will be talking more about the book because I think he's a big fan of the artist uh, and the book itself, and he uses it for references. So uh, he'll be talking a little bit about that. But if you're interested in winning that book, go ahead and start putting the, uh, the bids in the chat. And at the meeting, we'll tell the person who wins uh, what they need to do to go ahead and pay for that and we'll get that out to them in the mail so uh, Dave donated this book actually so I want to say thank you Dave for donate the donation for the support of the International Association of Woodcarvers uh, without people like you we wouldn't be able to have these meetings so thank you for your donation and we look forward to uh, to hearing about the book and about your carving so Dave I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you thank you for joining us today 
and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Thanks so much, uh, Blake and Tom and uh, Dave. Again, I want to thank each of you for all of your kindness and letting me have the opportunity to do this great carving show. I'm really excited about it, and and uh, it's an opportunity to really meet some needs. Um, talking about needs, I went to several different shows, the Conowego Club and the Delaware Valley Club and uh, another club. I forgot their name for the second because I'm somewhat off-centered, but... Nevertheless, um, I asked a lot of established carvers, what are you looking for when you look for training sessions online or, or at the International Association of Wood Carvers or Wood Carving Academy or taking classes? And almost all of them said, without rare exception, that they really like the idea of being uh, new techniques, uh, new styles of carving and uh, not so much the subject as much as it is uh, the skills. So some of the things I looked for were, if I'm not an artist, how do I find a really good way to find a way to choose something that would uh, be a potentially good carving? And uh, when you're not artistic, it is very difficult to um, really do, to pick a subject well, um, which led me to Dave Milan's book. I'm, um, I'm, I'm a steep fan of his, I really enjoy his art, but, um, and, and one of the reasons that I, I like him is because uh, in his book, there's all different kinds of, um, of styles of drawing and different subjects. Uh, there's, uh, there's children and there's uh, women, and the older men, and um, here's a woman, and it, they are potentially uh, really ideal for carving. And um, so in, in my travels, I came across this carving, and I was really enamored by his drawing. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble finding the center of the camera. <laughs> um, I was really enamored, and so I, um, my wife tells me, I'll talk to anybody, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> but I reached out to Dave and I says, Dave, listen, I'm a carver and I really would like to try carving one of your sketches. Would you have any objections if I did that? And uh, Dave was very kind and, and offered me a uh, very understanding response and said, absolutely, very supportive. And uh, so uh, being an artist and a musician and a vocalist myself, I think it's really important that we honor copyright, and uh, so I uh, I only chose his carving uh, because of this class. Because if if you need if you're not an artist and you can only draw flies, we can't draw anything down to paper. Uh, it's a really great way for you to find subjects. So uh, Dave is just an example of an array of artists that are out there that are very good sketch artists. So uh, that being said. That's why I offered the book. I think it's a great resource uh, for all the people uh, who are, again, especially not artists, or if you're looking for ideas, and there's no reason why you can't take an idea and modify it. So uh, that's the, the first reason why I chose the book, and it's really important uh, that you do that. Uh, the second thing is, is that I, um, listening to Dave and Ryan and Bob and a lot of Kevin and a lot of the guys, they offer a lot of insights into um, carving. And one of the things that I found to be our passion, and this is everyone's passion that's on this call, is, is that carving is unique. We start with this. We start with a block of wood and we make it in, we take away. It's a subtractive art. And so I came across this book which uh, it's more of a business book or a personal book about personal growth, but uh, it's by Henry Clouds called Necessary Endings. But uh, one of the references he has actually in the very beginning of the book is he says here, great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. And I thought that was very appropriate for what we do. And um, because again, we're gonna take this and we're gonna turn it into this. We're gonna turn it into this. 
uh, we're going to turn it into something that didn't exist. We're removing from this to get to this. So I think it's, it's very interesting to come from a philosophical point to remove things from something. It's not like you're making a piece of furniture. Don't want to belabor the point. So uh, unfortunately, I only have the one camera, uh, but I do want, I need to switch it around. So I'm going to point down. So Blake, if you, if you just want to share some while I relocate the camera, that will be great. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know next week during our meeting with uh, Del Green, uh, we're going to have another knife um, that was donated to us by Helvy, uh, Helvy Knives that we're going to be auctioning off during the meeting. Um, so again, once again, I know people have a difficult time trying to uh, access one of their knives. Uh, they're a big supporter of ours. Uh, so if you're interested in, in picking up a knife from them, make sure you come on to the meeting next week. Uh, I'll have that knife available and we'll ship it out to you probably before Christmas uh, so that we can get it to you in time for Christmas. So thank you all for the support. And Dave, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Blake. Okay, so uh, the, I want my whole session today can be reduced down to the word carve. Now, underneath carve, the first that we're going to talk about is center line. Now, historically, most people have taken their block of wood and either introduce a line you know this way we go around and then this way and we bring it over across the top but my point is is that that will serve as the basis for all of the um things that we remove from this block of wood it's that center line i think that it is vital to understand that when we do caricatures and I, I learned this from Dave and Ryan in their class, as well as uh, relationships, relations, is, is that there is the difference between carving, I mean, caricatures and cartoons is exaggeration, but it has to be done in a relationship. It's not done just by, I don't wanna make the nose bigger, or the hands larger. I want to do something that is in relationship to the rest of the face. And so one of the one of the things that I have here on my wall is a Tom um, Richmond quote. The caricature's task is to find out what's about the subject that makes it unique, then alter those relationships to exaggerate that uniqueness. So, so um, one of the things that I really think it's important that we do is below that is an example, oops, of what using the Frank Riley method, we can take, and the first example on the left-hand side is a simple face. Then there's a, what's called polygram drawing well, you can take that drawing and make it into facets. Or if you notice the difference between the first one and the second one is that the second or the third one rather is longer than the first one. And obviously the last one is stretched wide to be exaggeration and with the features in relationship to, to each other. So it's, it's really important to understand that whenever we do in carving, that it needs to be done in relationship to each to what we're doing on the rest of the face. So Dave Milan's project really turns out well. Uh oh, that's not good. You're backwards. I'm so sorry. Okay. One of the things that comes into play is those relationships. The second is approach. It's really, really important that we approach this. I think I spelled that wrong. I have a spell check over here, but it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, is, is that there's an A, a B, 
and a C to this. The first, A, is the audience. I want to do something to the audience in watching my carving. So I'm keeping the audience in mind. B is for the birthday principle. And for the birthday principle, we would go in my voice classes, you would do ba 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 You need to resolve the D with a C. It's important that when you carve, that's a straight line, center line, Santa. It's a resolve that's straight down. So my C is down at the bottom of the B and typically your I would start at the top and work their way down the face and end at the beard. This is a curved center line. This curve begins at the bridge of the nose and works its way down and curves. Now, that's the birthday principle. Why use a circle? Because what will happen is, keeping an audience in mind, as we go, as the eye goes down, it's looking from the D to the C. It's looking to resolve this because it's not straight. When I make this and don't resolve the D to a C, it wants to go back and it loops around and it begins to look again. Each time the audience goes and looks, they'll look at this eye. They'll look at this mustache. They'll look at the waves and the beard. They continually do a circular motion because I am forcing them to resolve the D to the C, that's in the birthday song, the last note and the, and the one before it. So my point here is, I am asking the person to move from a straight line to a curved line by keeping them interested in the piece. This comes out of my bird carving. This is a project that I'm working on. It was interesting when I went down to the Conestoga and to the Delaware Valley carvers they actually asked me if I would be commissioned to do an entire flock of Canadian geese, and it's due the day after the next CCA competition. <laughs> At any event, this has a curved center line. And by having a curved center line, it brings the person repeatedly through the piece over and over again. And so you tend to look at more things. Oh, I didn't see that before. Oh, I didn't see that before. Oh, I the differences in the color. The difference, there is more mass when you, here, let me turn this around for a second. How are we doing, Mary? I can't see that. Okay, so this is my center line on my face. Now, if I were to keep myself straight, I would be that that's it I don't need anything there's my center line but watch my face if I begin to move my face. My my mouth will go completely past the center line. It is not a distortion it, it's a natural function of the chin moving from side to side by doing that all the features are moving, but when I do that. This bulbs out and this stretches. The nose turns. It's no longer straight. It's crooked. This, this reverse camera is really crazy because it's the other way around. It takes some getting used to be used to. And then the center line on the mouth is even more crookeder. So we can see so we have the eyes here, the nose, and then the mouth. And what's happening is it's going more to the side. I bring that into the carvings. That's the short of it. So C is create. C is create. So for R, we have the Riley method. There's actually three methods of carve of drawing heads. Uh, one of them is the there 
One of them is uh, Frank Riley. One of them is Andrew Lomas. And one of them is George Bridgman. Now, if you notice with Frank Riley, he has what he calls rhythms. What Andrew Lomas begins with is actually a cross. There's a cross on the face. There's a cross on the ear. And what George Bridgman, Bridgman comes into is cubes on a cube. So typically, if you're going to keep a straight center line, the George uh, Bridgman method works very well to help people come up with uh, carvings. So V is for um, vital that it's touch that it's touch based. So oops, touch. So when I'm carving, I'm repeatedly touching the piece. I will use my fingers. I don't wear typically. I don't wear gloves. And I've never been cut in over 45 years of carving because I devote myself a lot to safety. And the last E is for every plane. As I begin, and you're going to see shortly, every plane that I carve has three facets to it. It's intentional. It's decisive. and it's clean. So when I take a block of wood, now that's that's today's class. If for nothing else, if you don't get anything else, this can be very helpful for you just by itself. So when I'm going to take Dave Milan's picture, and I'm going to reduce that down into a drawing, the first thing I'm going to do is reduce that to, instead of having a straight center line, I'm going to make that change at the bridge of the nose and, and turn it. The side picture, obviously, and if the old, my old drawings from my old math, I mean, my old uh, architectural drawing teacher, he'd be very proud. You know, you basically bring your lines across straight, unless you're nervous for a camera, but you would bring those across straight. And then what I do is I take this, I cut out the piece of paper. I use 77 and I spray it onto the block of wood. And then I go ahead and I actually just begin to cut it out. And that's how I get my rough out. So I've taken the design of the Dave Milan and I've reduced it to a piece of paper that's going to have two, a front and a side. Are there any questions so far? I'll take silence as a no. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start with, uh, this is what I did basically, this was early, very early first stage uh, to get it to a point of a simple block of wood. Uh, the next piece I did was I used a larger piece which is going to serve as my final example. And here, uh, a lot of people start with what they call the ears, uh, the area for the ears which are actually behind the center line. The ear is behind the center line for the rest of the head. But I wanna concentrate on the fact that as you run the center line down, the bridge of the eyebrows actually serves to build the rest of the face and head. So it's important that as you begin to carve, that uh, you would simply begin to understand that that's where I'm going to make my first cuts is I'm going to begin at the eyebrow ridge and using some of the Frank Riley method I'm going to have basically on the front head I'm going to have a, an area whereby the uh, forehead is then reduced to a shape similar to this and what that's going to let me do is it's then going to let me come in with a gouge. And I can begin to remove the material on either side of the forehead. Notice what I started with. I did not start with the ears. I started with the center line because this is the basis of all relationships. 
as well as I begin to lay the groundwork for and I'm going to actually use my fingers to see if I have the same depth on either side if it's the same height do I need to adjust it so I'm beginning with the eyebrow ridge and then what I'm going to is um, I'm going to come back behind that and I'm going to be begin to remove some of the material around the eyes down the side of the head and I would be building towards this curved area following down so my my headset's going to be this nose which is going to be about here i typically don't use marker i actually like to use colored pencils because what happens is it uh it comes off very easily and uh and it doesn't stay in your hands and it doesn't um So in quick work, I can begin to make, so I have my eyebrow ridge, I have the areas, we have the bottom of the nose, it's going to drive where the rest. Now, there's something to be said about where I want, so I'm going to basically, as I said, I started the project with the eyebrow ridge, the temple area, working my way down to the cheeks, I got the flat of the nose, I have even more of a pitch for the mouth. And uh, so I begin to carve that. So now what I would be doing is I would be carving out the area for the cheeks. But notice that I am carving intentionally. That's a very clean cut. And each time I cut, I am practicing intentional, decisive, and clean. So each time, every cut I make, I am considering where that cut is in relation to the other side and either side is smooth. Now, one of the things that I've found is very helpful is a strap of, this is inner tube. I actually get it in four by eight sheets. And what I'll do is if I find that there's a little scratch and I don't want to get up to, to go to hone it, what I'll do is I'll simply take, I simply take a rubber and I will literally just draw the knife across the rubber and I'll do three, one, two, three, and I'll do one, two, three the other way. And that restores the edge. I don't have to do anything other than that. And to what I do to cleaning it off is with uh, mineral spirits. It takes all the residue um, material off and it stays nice and clean. So that's one of the things that I find if I'm not getting clean cuts is to, is to actually manage the um the cut well um and and that could also mean for gouges i can do the same thing with the gouge so i can draw i can draw the gouge from one side to the other using a pencil grip and and just start either side and just work my way down across and it does nothing and you could also do the, now chris pie puts a two to three degree uh angle on the inside of his gouges this works well for anything I can just simply roll the rubber over and I can get on the inside of the gouge and it really can restore that edge very quickly and I'm done. I don't have to get up. I don't have to move. I can get back in here, begin to carve again. And again, notice the cut is clean. It's intentional and decisive. So we're working towards, because I'm trying to save time. Does anybody have any questions? None. Okay. What I tend to do is I like to begin early, pretty much at this stage, I'm actually looking where I'm going to go with my, with my placement of my features. So that it's important that right now at this stage, I am already taking those cuts and making those intentional placements. I am not just removing material. I am practicing making those kind of cuts that can be very helpful when the when the project is is nearing its completion. So by the time I'm much more advanced, you can really begin to see that there's quite a bit of detail already. Now the the reason that it was important to me that I be faithful to Dave Milan is is that there's some really subtleties to this face that to me is very helpful. Um, where did I get the rubber material? Um, I got it from a business that was going out. I got two four by eight sheets. And um, I can, if you're interested, 
I can send you, this is approximately uh, maybe two and a half inches wide by maybe uh, eight inches long, uh, nine inches long. If you're interested, send me an email or send it to Blake at uh, the uh, IAWC and we'll see about making some available to the uh, IAWC and then he can uh, get some proceeds towards the, um, uh, the uh, organization. Uh, so what I'm going to begin to do now is is I'm, I'm, I'm targeting the area around the eyes. And it's important that as the eyes work down and we have the placement of the nose. So the placement of the nose, I typically come in below and I come and I begin to get the uh, bottom of the nasal area so that it is not straight. It is important that the... Um, I typically use a blue pencil for my center line uh, because it's very, it's very, uh, it, for me, it's very helpful, very instructional. It doesn't go away. Can you get me a blue pencil for my bench? Thank you. My wife is here to help, help me in case I needed something. So, um, okay, so, so now what I'm going to begin to do is we're going to really begin to work on getting, getting the eye in place. So I'm looking for that ridge on the side of the head. And I, I really do like, when there is an indentation, particularly in older people, for the um, side of the temple area. On this, it seems to be very, to me, very strong. So I'm, I'm going to take that step and this is a 716. I'm going to take a nice open easy area to uh, all I'm doing basically is I'm pushing and while I'm pushing I'm dropping my wrist and I'm using a pencil hold and I will uh, remove that material so that comes out and we're going to get this area so beginning of the hair now it's very interesting when the hair transitions from the skin it's actually very thin it's almost non-existent because it doesn't just, especially in older people, um, like myself, uh, it doesn't really kind of come out on you. So uh, that said, um, it's, it's, you don't want it bulbed out. You want a nice transition away from the temple area back in. Same thing with the eyes. Um, should, I don't know, should I tell you what I'm using? This way you know this is an 11. Bob Hershey in my class with him turn me on to these 11s and i and i absolutely love them i so enjoy the fact that that the eyes are uh so well accomplished with this 11 and it's very um for me it's very helpful uh to get because it has a steep i'll use my 11 6. it has a steep wall it's much steeper than a simple u gouge and by having that side wall it doesn't connect so what's going to happen here is, is I'm going to begin to remove the material for the difference between the cheek. Now, oh, keep in mind something, the mass. Remember we talked about the mass when it stretches, it gets thin. So this side of the head, see if I can get this right. This side, you can already start to see it. This side of the head, it's coming in on this angle, but it's forcing the material, the mass shifts. So uh, to show you how it does on your own body, uh, take your uh, hands for me and uh, just uh, put them on either side of your face, uh, pretty much like where your cheekbone is. Now just move your mouth to either one side or the other and you should feel your cheek hit that hand. And you'll feel, if you bring your, your hands down over your cheek, you'll actually begin to feel the mass difference so that this cheek begins to bulb out and this one kind of gets settled in a little bit because it's stretching the mass although they were equal it's stretching so what's going to happen here is we don't want to take a lot of material away from the cheek area we want to leave it high but at the same time it's also being drawn back by that crooked smile so what I don't want to do is have this 
seriously advanced. Oh yeah, there was something else I wanted to talk to you about. The angle of the face, it's so important that the skull, now I guess the strong difference between a male skull and a female skull is its thickness. The male skull is significantly thick <laughs> over the female. But typically what happens is with a female, it's straight from the eyebrow ridge up, it goes straight. So what happens for me is I'll tendency to exaggerate the steepness of the forehead and tip it back a little bit more. And I'll also grab on the, the nose. And then I also like the angle of the face below it. So because his cheek, I mean, his chin is pushed back. What I have is, is a double chin happening here. The, all of that skin that was stretched out has been squished down and that plays out to a double chin. And so what's happening is we have the shift, the shift of the chin over to the one side and it, and back. So it's back further than what I typically might bring it back to. But in that effort to do that, it really will make a difference at the end of the day and the end of the game. I also think it's important that that also changes. I know Dave is a Dave Stetson is a real strong advocate for that uh, sterno um, Clio uh, mastoid sectional thing, some Latin word, uh, but it's at the base where the clavicle meets the uh, the sternum and the uh, the muscles that for the neck that needs to be pushed back in. But if I'm reducing the chin, the angle of the neck is going to change a little bit, but it's going to be massed up so that the Adam's apple would be a bit higher than it typically uh, would otherwise be if the chin were out further. So we can begin to see now that we're actually uh, removing some material. So um, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, I think it's important that you also know because there's more mass over here, what I don't wanna do is begin to take away too much cheek so that I want I want the cheek to be a little higher and I'd like this a little push back a little bit more to give even more of an impression of um, of that difference just a little bit not a lot Too big. This is a not a 712. That was a 716. I like my gouges because I can't I can't get in here with a knife. It would take out the nose too much. So can you um, can you bring me the um, uh, why old men have hairy uh, ears for me, please? Uh, it's important for me that we use different size gouges to do different things. I um, I really turned hard to the gouges to get that finished. Okay, so my wife brought over the uh, piece that uh, that did uh, very well in the CCA. And uh, what I want to point out to you is basically the same thing that I did here now. I can bring the chin the other way too, and uh, I'll show you another example of that in a little bit, but we can see here that in this case, there's a significant change to the face, and that curve can not only be a C, it can also be an S. So here's an example. He finished in second place in 2017 in the bust category. This is uh, Friday afternoon. And there's a, a, an S curve here. What happened is this goes this way and at the bridge of the nose, it begins to turn the other way. And so it's a little longer, this curve, but it is definitely longer. So you can see here now, there actually is a curve that goes this way and then it turns this way. So that's, that's my letter S. In the back of the head, you can see a little bit of it as well, but not as much, but, um, I think it's important, again, using that example of your audience, 
that I want to move the person through this piece. So what I did is as they got to the bottom of the chin, I kept their interest by having the shoulder and the fold of the t-shirt and then it full and it pulls away from the body. And then the old men have that little thing like I do in the back of your arm where you have this indentation. So those shadows are drawing the eye through the piece. They don't just stay there. And then I gave him more interest by having the folds and then having his shaky knees. And in his case, he has a toe fungus on the one foot. And then on the other foot, of course, is somewhat normal. So um, there's enough here to move the people, the person looking at the piece through the piece so that you don't stagnate. I'm coming in, I come down, I don't stop. I'm, I'm looping around and every time I loop, oh, I didn't see that. Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. And of course I use myself as in my own example. So the problem is the hands are actually very similar to my own, the way that his positions are. But um, I think it's important that you work on your hands. This actually is the fifth hand that I carved. I wasn't happy with him. And I had to uh, use the uh, arm and I carved in a watch so that you didn't see the joint from the, but I matched the grain so that the, the, it, the, the lighting isn't so hot, but um, you can still see the grain of wood on the piece and uh, throughout the piece, it's just a nice light wash. And, and again, the same thing as you move around, the eye is drawn to what's happening down here. And then I'm gonna move you through this way. I'm gonna turn it and bring it down so that there's movement to the piece. It's not just stagnant. So that's, that was my thoughts on him. And I had to have just a hint because it's a family show. I needed to have just a hint that it's early in the morning and he's uh, having a little challenge here. So, um, and of course, again, that little floppiness in the back of the ear, the, the arm and uh, somewhat of the head. But again, we need, so we have a lot more uh, area mass here than we do on this side. It's pretty much simple, it's plain. Whereas here, look at all the differences and all the deep uh, contours that are here versus here. So that's an example. And of course, now I'm also using the eyebrows. In the eyebrows, I'm helping bring the person through the piece. It's not just stagnating. So I look up to the, to the scissor, I move it through the eyebrow, into the eye, and I move them right along and I bring it through and down. So even the, the hair on the, I mean, the hair on the opposite side is the same way as drawing through. Um, so, and then he, he's pinned into here and then off he goes. So are there any questions about this piece? I needed something, I needed something to do this with. How do I, oh, there's a question. It's an amazing carving, really. Well, thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. But one of the things that I, and thank you, I mean that genuinely. One of the interests, one of the problems that I have, he's supposed to be looking in a mirror. How am I gonna have a mirror and not exclude him? It can't be too small, but it can't be too big. So a lot of thought goes into the audience. A lot of thought means I need to be able to show that he's looking so the eye placement, the cornea uh, and the pupil really need to be placed in a place that is, and of course now there's other things, subtle, subtleties to this that I also like to bring in. So in here we have the old pedestal sink, I have the uh, towel, and then I have even, if we can see it, we actually have the pipes in the back of the sink for the cold water and the hot water. On the white paper you can, yeah, there it is. Let me move this. So we can see the three pipes in the back of the sink as well. So, so everything is there to keep them interested. Oh, I didn't see that before. Oh, I didn't see that before. So that's done with a lot of thought. And again, I'm thinking of the person looking at it. Even the floor is worn here because every morning uh, this old gray dog like me stands here and he tries to do this again and again and again. So the floor is actually a different color here than it is here and the eye We'll catch that and keep moving. The whole point here is to have the person keep moving. Can uh, Q bring this back and bring you the link in now? So I want to try if I can bring this up a little bit. Bear with me. Oh, I can't get it to 
stay stable. Okay. Okay, this Lincoln is another whole thing altogether. Um, there is 173 hours in Lincoln, and there's 168 hours in a why, hair, why, why old men have hairy ears. Um, one of the things that I want to point out to you is the hand. If I were to, let me see, Ooh, one hand. If I were to take a straight edge, you would notice that the chin is actually over. It is not in a line, the center line. The center line is curved around the fingers, intending to be like the hands of a clock. So that as the hand of the clock sweeps, it sweeps through it. It emphasizes it's going to draw the person through the piece. So the, the finger is over the ear. The eye, the hand, the finger rather, is over the eye, and the other finger is under the nose, and his mouth is closed, so he's actually only breathing through one nostril. So what that's doing is it's causing the person to continue to look through the piece. It's be, it keeps them moving through the piece. And then, of course, we have the texture. So I added the buttons, and I added the chain, and I added the fold. And of course, now we have a little bit more angst. Now, one of the things that I do with some of the carvings that I do is intensify the relationship of the feet by having this foot is larger than this foot, creating the impression, if I could get it far enough away, the impression that you're looking at it as if his foot is in the front. So it will have the impression that the, it has, again, a relationship to each other, that it has interest. But I'm, I'm moving the person through the hand, the face, down the center. It's going to follow this edge. Now, where does it go? This captures the books. There's two books on either side of the Lincoln Memorial. So what happens here is this now brings in, and we see, uh-oh, it's breaking. So I'm moving the hand, I'm moving the eye. Now I have pieces here on the, on the ground. I have this, which is a separate piece that's breaking off. There's a crack that's running. So I am making more and more interest for the people who are going through this and look at it and look at it and look at it. I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to do other things as well. Notice that the hand is in front of it, but that you also have a curve here. There is a curve from the finger to the leg and turns out to the foot. There's a curve that goes from here to here to, to here and then follows this crack down. I am causing the person to move through the piece. I'm using curves to do that. Again, the difference of resolving the D to the C. And even on the back, there's still more curves. There's more things happening. I have the, the, the uh, curve and, uh, of the folds. The shoulder is higher on this side. And so what's happening is the, the tension draws to the shoulder away from this one. But it also allows the person to move it along. And then I'm going to move them through here to catch this drape. It's really important that that person move through this drape and then I even have a crack in here so that there are cracks to draw the person all the way down only to bring them back around again. So throughout the life of the piece, I'm asking the person, I'm telling the person that it's unresolved. There's something that keeps my interest. And by doing this to the carving, it allows me to know this is one piece of wood. The whole body of Lincoln is one piece with the exception of this foot. So this, the chair is another whole piece. This is one piece. This is one piece. And the base is uh, Honduras mahogany. And uh, that is also one piece. Now, and how I did the, uh, the Lincoln Lament was I printed out on a computer a font that was pretty close to the, um, to the uh, original monument. I can't do that. Okay. 
So I can get it. And then what I did is I taped it to the front and I used a, a uh, burner and I just burnt it in. And then I carved it by giving it a little bit of depth. So each side had a little bit, but how, that's how I accomplished the letters, just by printing it on a computer and using my burning tool to burn through the paper and then get the um, information on the front. Are there any questions about him? Hey, Dave, can you talk a little bit about the painting process? Painting process, yeah. I use oils. I don't use um, the acrylics. Um, I soak the piece in mineral spirits, and while it's still wet, I will put on washes of oil-based paint. I use the Windsor Newton pieces, and um, I, uh, I, I will texture it with the brush that I'll use. Uh, so the, the painting process is um, oil-based, not uh, latex-based, because to me, the water swells the wood, and some of the quality of the carving, the cuts that I've made, could be lost by that swelling process. So now here's, here's this fellow here, and um, he's really upset. He actually, his dentures, you can't really see, the pictures aren't so good here, but the, um, the dentures are slipping down. You know, when old men, I don't wear dentures, but if I did and I got upset, they would slide down. So he's actually more red in the face than the other fella is, but he's also looking at the other man. Yeah, he's looking at the other man. He's looking um, straight out. He's not looking down. And so what's happening is he's a kind of a raggedy fella. He's got uh, more hair. And I use the Jim Heiser method of, uh, of uh, splitting out with a V tool. And then I glued these in and lightly carved them, um, lightly painted them. And again, we have the same thing. We have uh, movement. Uh, his face is curved uh, to this side and a a away from the point of con con um, conflict. And um, so here is, uh, it's very soft. Uh, it's very washed. Uh, there's probably going to be about eight washings of color on here. It's always with mineral spirits and oil based. I don't use, um, I mean, oil based paint. I don't use anything else, uh, flesh tones. I typically do not use um, uh, antiquing process because to me, it mutes the color. It takes away the valleys that I want to show the color. And I can, I like to add uh, a darker uh, of the same color, a, a darker. So if I'm going to use a burnt sienna or if I'm going to use a, um, terra, a terracotta color, I may want to go to a darker shade of that same color. And that's all done with mixing. Um, and typically, I don't use a black. I make my own black with a combination of um, uh, ultramarine blue and burnt uh, umber. Uh, so the... the um, the, again, the, the shoes are more in caliber of with the Velcro, and again, it's soft. Uh, the, the, some of the washings you can see here, there's a little bit more color. We're still taking bids. Okay, good. Um, so we can see here that the, he's a pretty common guy. He's got old fedora on, and uh, so now what's happening here is, and I don't know how well I'm going to be able to show this, so what's happening here is they are going for the same last, he wants, oh, sorry. <laughs> so what happens is, so this fellow is reaching for, and he's looking again, he's looking at this man here. Now to create a conflict for the eye, for the beholder, is, is that this fellow here, now it's interesting in the CCA picks. He's actually facing this way. Uh, he's actually facing this way. The intention was that uh, he's facing. They're reaching for at the same distance for the last roll of of uh, toilet paper. So now, if, if we were to take him for a second, um, we have a lot more detail. He's uh, a lot more dapper. He's like uh, uh, um, Tom with a real sexy hat. And um, he's got uh, a color-coded uh, 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 face mask, and he's looking down. 
He's looking at the toilet paper. He's not looking at the other man. He's got his eye on the prize. Again, there's a lot more detail in the, sh in the sweater. Uh, he's got a little bit more of a uh, nicer pants on. And of course he has those uh, Air Jordans, I think there are Air Nikes on. I think all old men own those, at least one pair. So uh, that and plaid, all old men wear plaid shirts. <laughs> So, uh, and now what happens is even the soles of the, even the underneath part is painted so that when his heel is up and you look from the side, it, you can see that the heel is, has been painted. Uh, also with this, uh, this gentleman, this gentleman's uh, walker is simple, just like him. It's more direct. He's just no, no concrete kind of literal guy. I got my eggs. I got my broccoli. I got my my uh, bananas and there's a couple of things down inside there the uh, pieces were carved separately the these two pieces were carved separately and added and then what i used is a very fine brass rods up the center i have very fine drill bits and i don't know if you can see or not i'm not dropping anything here there are little holes there's one right here there it is there's little holes where those wires go so it will always land there. Now, because this fella's hand is here, he's pushing, he's gone past, but he's still got a need for the walker. So he's hanging on with his right hand and his left hand is reaching for the uh, thing. This here, it's the same deal, but in his case, he's still holding on. He has his hand in, I don't know if I can show it or not. Yeah. He has just backwards and forwards. It's crazy. He has his hand actually around the handle, um, but on the opposite side, on the wrong side. So now his walker, his walker is all sexed out. His uh, seat comes down and goes up. I did that with the wires. Uh, the bread has been painted so that it looks like it's cellophane. And how I did that was I painted it brown first, and then I added the speckles. And then I added a white wash on where the creases are and uh, soft, soft, like only maybe two washes, just enough to make it almost look translucent. Then my wife's favorite tea. And then there's a little can of something in here. And then there's this oat milk. The oat, oat milk was very detailed. Will it do that? I don't know, probably won't. So it's very detailed. So he's got all this sexy stuff. He's got, there's a little, um, I have a metal flake I'll put in the uh, paint. So I don't think it'll show. But uh, all the entire uh, uh, walker has been uh, added uh, with a little metal flake so that it shows up and is certainly much different uh, than this fella's walker. Very simple, uh, very ornate here, very simple here. Simple groceries, higher end groceries. So there's a tension that's happening. Even the way that the floor, they engaged on the floor. So that this fellow, when he was here, it was important that their hands are the same distance from the prize. And the prize is separate. So that's how this was made. I made these all the same way. I took a piece of paper. I burnt the, um, through the paper. And I was able to replicate that. This is not laser printed. It's actually just hand uh, done. And uh, the toilet paper has a lot of detail in it. I took a Scott paper towel. I mean, it's got toilet paper. And uh, I even put the little barcode thing on it. And uh, there's some information on the backside underneath there. So I wanted it to look as real as possible, but it's not flat. It's the last one. It's been pushed down. It's soggy. Down over here, it's flat. Over here, it's a different shape. It's round. It's kind of a little bit oblong, rather. It's a little flattened out in here. It's hard to show. But um, the reason I did all of this, and then, of course, this goes back in these two holes, so it'll always be here. But the point is, is that the floor isn't, it's enhancing their confrontation. It's not just random placed on the wood. And again, how I did the same thing is with an oil base, multiple washes. I wanted the oak to come through. And, uh, and then uh, this piece here also comes off. 
and that was the same way. I carved it to have depth. And then I came back in and painted it. Now this was painted with the uh, regular uh, paper. I mean, the um, uh, the acrylic paint that, that we all use um, from uh, Hobby Lobby or whatever your source is. So uh, again, and the ribbon was something that needed to make sure it folds back. So it, it's gonna roll and then it's gonna roll again and it's gonna roll back. So it was unwinding and coming around. So I wanna make it interesting for the person that they're not just stagnant. It's not just straight up and down anymore. I'm really looking at a lot of different things. I wanna keep their interest. And again, I didn't see that before. I didn't see that before. I didn't see that before. And that's what I want to happen. I want the people who are looking at it to say that repeatedly. And by doing that, I'm using a lot of different subtleties to draw the eye through it. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I have the whale now, please? Oh, the whale's here. For those who wanted to know, this was my first carving piece. And when I teach, this is the first piece that I introduced people to carving with. Uh, this was from uh, 1984. And um, my teacher uh, wanted to introduce whole issues of grain change, of center line, of, of symmetry, of uh, really getting also, this was my very first, uh, what I regard as my current carving. And that was uh, back in 1984. And of course, the cat decided that uh, she thought it was a good piece of fish, so she helped herself to a little gnawing there. But um, so let's see. Um, how much time do we have there? We got an hour and two. It's a little after four o'clock. I didn't think we were going to finish. It was more important to me that I gave you all of these different skills, and hopefully you've come with a, a, a benefit of um, – of, of learning more about how these all of these relationships happen on a face and it's so important that you apply yourself with your tools and um, and I, I really can't encourage you enough to keep going but I see in a lot of who I call intermediate carvers that the cuts are not as clean as you would like and I think um, I think that's accomplished with a, a nice sharp tool but more importantly is to be intentional. And I use my carving throughout the piece to continue to hone those skills. So here's an example of too many carving. There's too many pieces. Uh, let me see if I can get the facets right. There's two, there's one, two, three, four, five. I would rather take this and make one cut in here. To me, that has more appeal. So what I've done is I've taken that and the unique part about carving is I don't want it to look like epoxy. I want the facets to be an important part of what's happening with the sculpture. I don't want it just to be a nice, soft uh, piece. Now, when it comes to a woman, uh, Mary brought the other piece over the, the uh, piece of um, uh, the woman. Uh, as uh, my class with Ryan was very, very helpful. The face needs to have a lot of very simple facets, uh, so it's important that you do that. But in everything else, again, I, I have the person, so the, this was the actual front, is actually the back, and the back is actually the front. So I cause a lot of drama by bringing the eye through, it comes down her face, hits her hair, comes to the handle of the purse, goes down the purse, hey, hey, hey going down to the feet, <laughs> no stopping. And uh, what I also did is cause drama by elevating her foot and her foot is beyond the end of the uh, base. So she's out there and then um, her feet, her toes are off the, the sandal on here. And I actually put the staining uh, when uh, ladies uh, walk on sandals the leather has a little way of staining, so I put that up underneath there. And uh, in my process, I carved off this piece right here. So I had, I had to add that piece, but it proved to be helpful because I could get in there underneath the arch a little bit easier. But again, herein, I want to draw the person. So 
here is again, I'm going to come to the hair, I'm going to bring the person through this way, and then they're going to catch this and then come down to the bottom of the, um, the feet. So I'm bringing the eye repeatedly, I'm going to start here at the rose on the hat, come down the hair, I'm making them unresolved, I don't want a straight line, I don't want, for me, this is only for me, I'm trying to keep them engaged. I have a tendency when I look at this to start at the top, go down and I stop. By having all of these other tensions in here of textures, of garment folds, of, of uh, all the other things, the hair, I'm, I'm introducing things that keep the eye going. I, I, oh, I didn't see that before. Textures, color, um, placement, um, all of this stuff together really works, I think, to make a big difference. But again, I've done this for a long time, and uh, I put a lot of thought. Uh, she has 158 hours in her. So this does not come simple. There's a lot of time spent with this. And if the truth be told, since it's just you and I, the red dress is too, I put the wrong shade on. So it, it, was, it was too blue, and I wanted it more orangey yellow. So it's actually too deep. I'm, I'm dissatisfied with it. But like Ryan uh, said in one of my classes and Dave and a couple of fellas, if you make a mistake, you learn from it and move on. And the next, I, I won't use that color except on a different piece of wood to test drive it first. Are there any other questions? Hey, Dave. Yes. Uh, Myron Compton here. Uh, hey, Myron, how are you? I love your uh, work. Okay, hey, congrats on your CCA wins, number one. But number two, your uh, rubber straw there, do you have any compound on that at all or is it just a plain rubber? Just a plain rubber. I use mineral spirits to make sure it's clean. And then I'm, I'm gonna tell you, Myron, this puts such an edge on it just by running it along. And this is, um, now you can get them in Home Depot. Um, it's basically uh, one of those butcher block tables. It's great. And I have two small horses. Actually, Lowe's is having them on sale for 14 bucks right now. But what happens is I put that edge on, and man, does that it just hold such a nice edge, puts it right back on, and I'm ready to roll. It's handy. I can do inside gouges outside. It's really handy. So if anybody's interested, they can give me a scream. I'll send you until I've, I'm out of my stock. Right now I have three four by eight sheets. So thanks, uh, Matan. Thanks. Serve okay. a lot of carvers, Myron. All right, appreciate that. Thanks, and again, great job. I love your work. Thank you, buddy. How many carvings do you think you've done in your lifetime? Oh. <laughs> I stopped counting Very when good. I hit 500 and change. Only because with the CCA competitions, there's nothing on, on here that would indicate me. There's, I, I still, I used to letter mine, I mean, I used to number them. So somewhere, well, keep in mind, I also had a, a, a dimensional sign company. So I did a lot of carving on signage. I also do instruments, um, uh, furniture. So altogether, <clears throat> wow, maybe 4,000, maybe? Ooh. That's a That's conservative a figure, but... Uh, one of the things that I, uh, since nobody asked, I was going to try to show this without getting the people sick, is, is that I like to have my gouges handy. So these are acrylic, and they pick up and they go right into, I don't have to do anything to them, and nobody touches each other. I have to do the same thing with my knives. I worked with Kevin and uh, Ron Dowdy, and they were looking for a, basically a piece to um, just be able to take the knife, and have it completely safe and drop down. But uh, since we're here, uh, people sometimes ask some of the other people, what does your shop look like? I think it's really important that you have a creative space that really does well. So for me, my shop looks more like a barn. So I have barn wood and pictures and all of my, my stuff is back here. I have... Uh, all different kinds of things. I love lighthouses. Uh, my wife has my, my wife says I'm a lighthouse keeper. 
I don't think she means that. I think she meant a lighthouse keeper. But uh, nonetheless, let me get out of the way here. And uh, then I have my dad's first car driver, um, license plate and my first license plate. And uh, then I have a uh, wood over here. That's all my stockpiles I have here. I have down underneath here. And then they run down here. Uh, I can't go too far, but back over here, if you can see that large tan board there, that's a router duplicator table I made for gun stock carvings or for making rough outs. And I can go up to a full uh, uh, 12 inch depth with that router. So I can spin it 12 inches, so it's six inches deep. And uh, then you have all of my, my, car, my sharpening tools here. And my books are in the back there and I have my door so that uh, I keep my shirts there. I mean, my, uh, and then all my tools are kept nice and neat and, and away. So that's the shop, if anybody was interested. That's my creative place. Do you sell any of your carvings? Like I have uh, in the past. Um, I don't like to do that uh, because of the commitment that I've made to the piece. So if I'm going to make something to sell, like um, the bird carving that I was talking about, uh, this piece here, uh, that's a commissioned piece. So I put a little bit more detail in it. I want the person to, um, to like what they've purchased. But uh, it becomes uh, a challenge to so what my wife and I have agreed to since I'm research and development and I asked my wife to come up with a dollar value for me so the pieces that I do sell. Uh, it's a collaborative effort on both of our parts so that we're not just. Uh, um, just me coming kind of picking it out uh, let's see maybe 200 bucks you know so i'm working for like four cents an hour. <laughs> So it's, it's a collaborative work and my wife is very helpful with that. So the answer would be number one, if I'm going to make it to sell, I'll make it to sell. If I'm going to make it to show or to compete or just because I'm getting older. Um, and one of the things that I found with my mom when she passed was um, I come from a long line of artists and uh, you couldn't get enough of her work. We could not get enough of her paintings of her quilts. So I'm now moving towards uh, making things for legacy to give to family members so that everybody has a couple of things uh, of mine. So right now that's what I'm working with. But if anybody did have an interest in me carving something, um, you know, I certainly would be open to that. But I approach it somewhat differently because the emotional investment isn't quite the same if I'm going to make it to sell. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Hey, Dave, you may have uh, touched on this in the beginning, but did uh, do you draw out all of the designs that you're planning on carving um, in the beginning, or do you just kind of go, you know, you get an idea in your mind and then just go from there? Uh, the answer to that question is interesting. I tend not to turn to clay. Um, I tend to draw it out by hand, sketch. Um, I will sketch first the front and then the side, uh, very similar to um, this. I'm, I'm going to start with the, just a very simple concept drawing and then expand it out from there. Once I'm here, I put it to the wood and start and it's go. I, I don't typically make a transition from a sketch to because I do have the ability to see it. It's an odd, I'm very left of center. <laughs> so what happens for me is that I have the ability to, I'm trying to find a place that I can keep this without having to keep moving. I don't know if that works any better or not. Um, what happens is it has a tendency to, I'm able to spin it. I can see it from all sides without sketching a thing. So so for me, it's it's helpful to be able to um, go from sketch right to the wood and then I'm creating it as it's done. I don't have a tendency to, I don't like replicating my work. I, I like unique pieces. So I approach it with a thought process and, and a sketch. 
Does that help? It does. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, I was talking with uh, 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 Mr. Arroyo. I can't think of his first name for the second. He's up and coming. Josh. Josh, yes, thank you. Josh asked me that question. I said, you know, one of the things I do to get a sense of where it can go is I'll sketch on a piece of paper what I want to do. And then I'll go to Adobe Illustrator and I'll modify the sketch with layers. And I can move the arm, I can, you know, twist the body, I can move the legs, uh, I can do that in layers. And, uh, and that allows me to use a creative process in Adobe Illustrator uh, to actually get a rendering that I'm liking, like getting uh, the proportions and the body symmetry the way I want. I want the movement, you know, I want this and I want that. And so I did that with the Lincoln. He, he was a, but if you saw my early sketches of the, uh, the uh, uh, old men have hairy ears, very simple drawings, and then it's go from there. Thank you. All right, we're at about 20 after four Eastern time. Any other questions for Dave today? All right, and uh, the bid on the book right now is at $30. If anybody else wants to bid on that, uh, now's the time to do that. Uh, Dave, I just wanna say thank you for coming on today. Fantastic work. You and I have talked offline a few times uh, through chat and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Uh, it's amazing what you've done with the pieces that you've submitted to CCA. So uh, fantastic. It was great to hear about those today. And uh, thank you for the donation. Thanks for coming on, talking to us today. Uh, we look forward to other works that you do and uh, the things that you post. So uh, continue to share and we look forward to that. Um, just want to remind you all. Go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. No, thank you for everyone. I really appreciate it. And please support uh, Blake and Dave and uh, Tom for their efforts. This is just a fantastic forum and uh, we need to really rally around them and really, really make sure that uh, we give them our support. Thank, Thank you, Dave. You we, sure, we appreciate Good that. Sure, um, just want to remind everybody again, next week, uh, the schedule will be, uh, we'll have Dell Green on next week. That's December the 11th, again, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the same number. Uh, and then we'll round out the year with Eric Owens uh, on December the 18th. Uh, we'll be doing some giveaways and uh, maybe an auction during that meeting. So uh, make sure you join us on that day. We've got some special things coming up for that. Uh, then we'll close out uh, for Christmas and New Year's and start back in January. Um, so make sure you uh, tune in for the International Association of Woodcarvers. Uh, go out and check out our videos on YouTube. We have over 70 videos at this point uh, between International Association of Woodcarvers and the Carving Podcast. Uh, there's quite a bit of free information out there on uh, YouTube. Uh, that we've tried to share with Carver. So make sure you check that out and subscribe to those channels if you can. And uh, we'll see you all uh, next week again at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with uh, Mr. Del Green on December the 11th. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you.